So what you just saw was my last little verification check that all computer uh, uh, systems, you know, are operating nominally, what we call operation nominal. And as soon as that happens, I turn the lights off, and you know, <laughs> hit the unmute button, and the observers are sitting at headquarters tonight, and just told them that they can get started. So where are the researchers actually, bit? where is the headquarters? Headquarters in my bed tonight. Oh, that, oh wow, and they just do everything remotely, that's amazing. Now, uh, we have, uh, this is a NASA night, so the observers are actually from Arizona, and they do not have a direct polycom uh, link to our headquarters, so they uh, all came out to do their observing. Now, if this had been a Caltech or a UC uh, observer, uh, they don't even bother coming out, they just observe from their member institutions, because they have all the setups that have direct connection links to us. So the telescope operator at night is actually you know, on TV, you know, directly yeah. interfacing with the astronomers. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's some famous photographs of the Keck observatories shining those lasers, mm -hmm. and those are to ionize the atmosphere and create a fake star, is that right? Uh, actually, the, the, uh, ionize the sodium layer. The sodium layer. Yeah, there is uh, about 100 kilometers up, there's a naturally occurring sodium that uh, comes in from space. So that's above the troposphere? Yeah. Wow. Top end is the troposphere. It's not actually above it, it just sits okay. near the top. And how powerful are those lasers then to achieve uh, that? Well, you know, we send up you know, anywhere from a low, we can get a return at around 9 or 10 watts, but it doesn't give us a good return. Sure. So we usually uh, crank up uh, where we can. Uh, in fact, that's a new laser system that uh, is being... Uh, one second. Go ahead, Rob. On the Keck 2 secondary stall fault. Okay, uh, then come down below 20 degrees and try a full on re net there. I may have to go run and try to shoot that other side. So, anyway, uh, the. Uh, um, where was that? The uh, lasers. Oh, the lasers. Uh, yeah, we, uh, the Keck uh, 2 is an old dye laser, it just got decommissioned. It has a new laser in it that's now uh, beta testing. And then the Keck 1 laser is like uh, about a year old. Uh, that one uh, right now is a crystal laser, and that can get us upwards to uh, 20 watts wow. on sky. And excellent returns. So artificial stars, since we know what the property of the sodium light should be, and by the way, sodium doesn't, light does not occur naturally in the universe. It's a man-made thing. So when we have uh, it return, we know what it should be. So we have algorithms that actually correct for the atmospheric blur on a little deformable mirror. So the little mirror by Navig uh, has a uh, little piezo pin actuator behind it and corrects it 400 times per second. So the science light will actually hit this deformable mirror. Atmosphere is now subtracted and we get Images that are clearer than Hubble up in space. Wow. So it's a calibration using the atmosphere. It's so using, yeah, using the, the return um, of the sodium light okay. to find out what is the atmosphere doing. Because you have, you have, you expect a particular spectrum. Yeah, we know what it should be. Yeah, yeah, so okay. all we do is reverse it. Brilliant. And, and the atmosphere, it's, it it varies like 400 times a second. You really need to. Oh, the correction is 400 times. The right. atmosphere varies whatever the atmosphere is going to vary. It's, right. high, it's variable. Because uh, you could say maybe you do it one, once a minute and that's enough. But oh, no, no, gosh, no. no. 400 times per second is the precision we need. Oh, wow. That's and that's only, uh, you know, uh, that's old technology. We are actually working on next generation uh, laser uh, systems that will have five lasers on the telescope and we will correct it 1,500 times per second. So we'll have smaller areas of correction. Right now we correct for the whole, across the whole mirror, one algorithm. In the future, we will have five algorithms collecting for, correcting for smaller areas for that much better accuracy. Does that um, have an improvement in terms of the resolution as well, or just the quality of your interpretation of what you're picking up? Uh, that's an interesting question, resolution. Uh, it will resolve... Uh, as far as the blur is concerned, much better, obviously much better. But the key to it is size, sure. okay? How do we get better images than Hubble? Size. 
This is, a, is a two 10 meter, meter. This is 10 meters. Theirs is two. We just collect more photons, so we get more resolution yeah. capability. Now, the 30 meter, which is the next class of telescope being built, that's going to be more like, you know, you know, well, it's a, if you do the math, it's, you know, three times as large, yeah. uh, so it has exponentially that much better resolution. Um, in fact, that's one of the interesting things about tonight's program, science program, using MOSFIRE. Uh, we are looking back at high redshift galaxies. These are redshifts greater than seven. This is less than a billion years after Big Bang. We're trying to look at the dawn of the universe. Now, technically, the dawn of the universe is 600 million years after Big Bang. And that's when the reionization occurred. Plasma was something we can't see. We can't detect it. Uh, it's just an energy that we don't have the ability to you know, look at. So, plasma pools, atoms form, protons, electrons, neutrons come together. Okay? That forms mass. The minute you have mass, you have gravity. Okay? When you have gravity, you have attraction. Okay? All these atoms now come together, and pretty soon you have stars. When they are of sufficient mass, they turn on, they go nuclear. That's the dawn of the universe. Mm -hmm. That's the visible universe that we can see. Okay? 10 meters does not get us to that boundary layer or line. Okay? Except in there's always an exception, isn't there? Uh, a serendipitous discovery done this year where there was a hole in the interstellar medium that allowed the Lyman Alpha mission from that boundary lever to actually make it normally it's absorbed. Okay? And we can't see that boundary. We can only detect optical light of different elements, not the Lyman Alpha, which is, you know, a hydrogen three. Okay, so it's a it's a easily absorbed signal. Okay? Well, we are now looking at that boundary, or at least that discovery was. It was such a momentous discovery. Everybody is jumping on the bandwagon. They want moss fire and they want to look back that far because they want to see what the early elements are, the early structures are, so on and so forth. This is a huge area of investigation in the international community. So that's what they're happening tonight. And MOSFIRE is uniquely qualified to do that because it's highly efficient. It is a spectrograph in the infrared, which means that uh, it's looking at the component light uh, you know, that's coming through. Now, normally infrared instruments can only look at one object at a time because that slit, what we call the slit, where the light comes through and onto the detector, uh, has to be cryogenically cooled to helium temperatures. Okay? That's four degrees Kelvin. That's awfully close to absolute zero. So here we are. MOSFIRE has what we call a configurable mechanism internal to its cryogenics. And it has the ability to configure 47 slits. Now think about that. These are bars that move back and forth, and the distance, obviously, between two bars is the slit that the light comes through. Okay? Now, that is a mechanical motion okay, occurring at 4 degrees Kelvin. Okay? What's the big deal about that? Well, we can't use electricity to drive that, okay? because you're introducing heat into a helium, waste of, you know, so it's done by magnetics. Okay? These bars move back and forth using magnetic you know, induction and presto. And it's the only instrument on Earth that can do that. Okay. Everybody else has to look at one at a time. Got it, Mark. Okay, sounds like I've got to head down your way and start uh, the troubleshoot. Thank you for your time. You. What, what is your name, by the way? I'm David. David. One so anyway, that's Techno One Science Night. Should be rather exciting. Look for uh, new discoveries about the most distant object ever observed. In fact, really? I talked to an astronomer a couple of weeks back who is the current record holder, and he left a very tantalizing uh, afterthought as I was exiting the room by saying, I'm looking at another one that I think is further away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I hope it goes well. Thank you. Okay. Well, have some fun. I'm glad you guys made it by. At least uh, the timing was excellent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> serendipitous uh, yeah. on that. So anyway, enjoy the afternoon. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks.